بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمد ونصلي على رسول الكريم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته respected listeners today I am going to speak on a very important and novel topic titled fathers of modern sciences you can also say Muslim fathers of modern sciences Alhamdulillah the founders of fundamental prime scientific subjects today were Muslims. The topic today is open to all, but it is especially incumbent and inherent upon Muslims to know about the achievements of their forefathers who salvaged humanity from the abyss of ignorance. At the outset, let me apprise you that my today's talk is not an abhorrent attempt to quash the great works of Isaac Newton or Edison, etc., but to underscore the accomplishments of those pioneers who reached the pinnacle of knowledge from the 9th till the 14th century. Yes, this was the golden era of Islam which became a cradle and a template upon which the future scientists developed their empire. The innovative iridescent colors of their work are a perpetual part of the progress and development of the later times. Muslims should feel pride and honor of their forefathers as Baghdad and Cordoba remained the greatest centers of knowledge for many centuries. After the end of Umayyad dynasty, the new Abbasid rulers felt the need of a new capital. On 30th July 762 AD, Caliph al-Mansur ordered the making of a new capital, Baghdad, which soon became the largest city of the world in terms of population. From Caliph Mansur till Al Mamun, the seventh Abbasid ruler, translations of books in Latin language were done to Arabic. And that was done in Baitul Hikmah or House of Knowledge, a House of Wisdom. Baghdad had many schools or madrasas and libraries which were the largest in the world. Madrasa Mustansariya had a big library which was the last major library of Abbasid time. Baghdad was seized on 10th of February 1258 AD by Halaku Khan, the grandson of Cengiz Khan. Halaku destroyed Baghdad. He killed most of the inhabitants, including Caliph Mustasim. They destroyed the irrigation system and ruined the city by fire and looting. Earlier, Cordoba had fallen to King Ferdinand in 1236 AD with the fall of two great centers of knowledge and learning. The golden era of Islam virtually ended and Muslims never recovered from this loss. In 1401, Baghdad was again sacked by Temur or Tamerlan who killed all the inhabitants. They destroyed the remaining libraries and burned the books. In 1492, the empire of Granada finally fell and Muslims were evicted from Spain. Excluding the medical manuscripts, remaining were burned and Muslims were forced to convert to Christianity or leave. Almost eight centuries of Muslim rule, starting from, uh, from the arrival of Tariq bin Ziyad on 30th April 711 AD, ended in annihilation of Muslims and they were banished from al Andalus or Spain. During the golden era of Islam, Muslims emerged as pioneers of almost all branches of scientific knowledge, and even the dissidents who vilify about the contribution of Muslims today, they agree that Muslims set a prelude to the European hegemony in modern sciences. With this background today, I will speak about the work of 12 founders of essential scientific literary subjects, uh, scientific and literary subjects, and they have been acknowledged as the fathers of their respective domains. To commence, Ibn Sina. I have a book about Ibn Sina here. To commence, Ibn Sina or Avicenna is reckoned as the father of medicine. Al-Zahrawi or al kasis is the father of surgery. Jabir bin Hayyan, also called Jabir, is known as the father of chemistry. Al-Khwarizmi or Al-Gorithmi is called the father of mathematics. 
ابن حیسم اور الحیزن is considered as father of optics and ophthalmology البیرونی who calculated the radius and diameter of the earth is father of physics ابن بیتار is father of botany الرازی also confessed as the second avicenna is called the father of pediatrics he is also endorsed as a pioneer of gynecology and obstetrics Ibn Nafis, who discovered the circulation of blood for the very first time, should be ratified as father of physiology. Al-Tusi is perceived as father of trigonometry. Ibn Khaldun is father of history or historiography. And last but not least, Ibn Battuta is father of tourism. Before I start narrating the illustrious works of these mistros, One by one, it is pertinent to keep three important points in mind. Firstly, these scholars and even others were not only expert in their particular fields, but were also good in other subjects. This is called polymaths. So they were all polymaths. Secondly, they had attained commendable religious education in their childhood and adolescence. In fact, it was their start. Thirdly, Just like the birds migrate from the cold areas to warmer places, most of them were born elsewhere, but they huddled to Baghdad, Cordoba and other cities where learning and education was being imparted. First of all, let's talk about the father of medicine, Ibn Sina or Avicenna, who was born more than 1000 years ago in 980 AD in Bukhara, Uzbekistan and died in 1037 AD in Hamdan, Iran. In fact, exactly 1000 years ago, Avicenna was active helping patients as he was a compassionate physician. His famous book, Al-Qanun fi Tib, or the principles of medicine, commonly called the canon, was taught in Europe for more than 500 years. With, the, with 1 million words in 14 volumes, The canon was also called the medical Bible. Hussein Abu Ali Sina completed early education at the age of five years. At the age of 10, he had become proficient in Holy Quran and Sarfo Nahu. His father was the governor of the region. Once a philosopher, Abdullah Nanki, Nanki came to Bukhara and lived in their house So Ibn Sina learned from him fiqh or the religious jurisprudence, philosophy and medicine. Ibn Sina opened his own clinic. In those days, Sultan Farrukh bin Mansur got sick and was treated by him. So at the age of 17 years, Ibn Sina was made the royal physician. In that position, he benefited a lot from the library. When Mahmud Ghaznavi conquered Bukhara, He fled to the Iranian city of Garganj and then started clinic in the Marjan, Marjan city. There the nephew of Sultan Qaboos became seriously sick and all physicians answered in despair to treat him. Ibn Sina examined him and concluded that he is in love with the girl and if he is married to that girl, he will become healthy. His advice was followed and the patient became normal. Sultan gave him too much respect. Ibn Sina then went to the city of Rev, Re, which is famous for polymath, Al-Razi as well. But he came to know that Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi is about to attack that city. So he went to Hamdan and started clinic there. Incidentally, Shamsuddin, the ruler, got severe abdominal pain and Ibn Sina treated him. In return, he was made a minister. To get benefit from Ibn Sina, who was called Sheikh, a lecture and a cross talk was organized every Friday where prominent scholars used to attend. There, once Abu Mansur Hayyan Lughvi satired upon him on some matter that you are an expert of philosophy and medicine, but not of literature or languages. At this, Ibn Sina was infuriated and he wrote a six-volume famous dictionary named Lisanul Arab. He also wrote Kitab al-Shifa on 18 volume, an 18-volume book and many other well-known medical books like the Sturatip, Principle of Medicine, Risala Fitashrihal Aadha, 
booklet on anatomy risala fi uruq al mansuda al ahwaza fi tib al adwiyat al qalbiya which is uh, medicines for heart kitab al qolanj maqala fi an nabz persian book andar danish rug which was about the pulse and one of his books hikmat al sharqiya was lost but his most important and famous book is al qanun fi tib or the canon which was taught in montpellier and leuven universities till 1605 ad even today in ukla and yale universities in the chapter of history of medicine a portion of the book canon is taught when his book al qanun fi tib was published people stopped using the books of galen razi and ibn abbas when press was invented was invented his book was published in 1476 ad and again in 1593 the book was translated into latin and widely used as a reference book the first chapter of his book al qanun fi tib comprised of anatomy the second pharmacology the third is about various diseases like headache psychiatric problems urinary tract stones cancers and the importance of its early detection etc the fourth chapter is about fever and infections and fifth chapter about creams and ointments and treatment of poisoning etc ibn sina is the first one to say that a new drug should not be used in general public unless it is tested on animals and a small group of people he narrated the difference between mediastinitis and pleurisy he described both types of facial palsy he said that tuberculosis is an infectious disease more than 760 medicines have been mentioned in his book al qanun fi tib he elaborated that an infection can spread by water and soil he described diabetes mellitus its treatment and complications of course his way of treatment will no more be applicable in the present modern times 1000 years ago ibn sina or avicenna said that a cancerous area should be fully removed he mentioned ankylostomiasis and said that it occurs due to a worm his book al qanun fi tib has been credited to be the most remarkable book of medicine avicenna was a staunch muslim and whenever he had a problem he used to go to the mosque and pray and used to get the solution he had memorized holy quran and in his last days he could not even stand but still he continued to recite holy quran finally i will read a portion of the first page of his marvelous book al qanun fi tib to take you back 1000 years and see that ibn sina himself what ibn sina himself wrote in arabic bismillah arrahman arrahim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa huwa hasabi wa thiqati alayhi tawakkaltu walhamdulillahi hamdan yastahiquhu bi ulu shanuhu wa subu ihsanuhu wa salatuhu ala nabiy Muhammad wa alihi wa ashabi wa ba'da faqad altamis minni ba'd khallas akhwani wa man yulzamni as'afu bima yasbah bihi wa sa'a an asnaf fi tib kitaban mushtamilan ala qawanin al-kulliyah wal juz'iyah al-shamaa yajma' ila sharh al-ikhtisar وإلى أيضا الأكثر حقه من البيان بعطر الإيجاز وأسعفته بذلك ورأيت أن أتكلم أولا في الأمور العامية الكلية في كل قسم الطب عن عني قسم عني القسم النظري والقسم عني القسم النظري والقسم العملي ثم بعد ذلك أتكلم أولا في كليات أحكام قوية الأدوية المفردة ثم في جزئيا ثم بعد ذلك في الأمراض الواقعة بأز أز فابتدا فابتدي اولا بتشريح ذلك ومنفعته واما تشريح الاعضاء المفردة البسيطة فيكون قد سبق مني ذكره في الكتب في الكتب الاول الكل وكذلك منافعتها ثم اذا فرقت من تشريح ذلك العضو ابتدات في الاكثر المواضع بالدلالة على كيفية حفظ صحته ثم دللت بالقول المطلق على كليات امراضه واسبابها وترك استدلالات وترك استدلالات عليها وترك معالجاتها بالقول كل ايضا فاذا فرقت من هذه الامور الكليه اقبلت على الامراض الجزئيه ودللت اولا في اكثرها ايضا على الحكم حكم الكل وحده واسبابه ودلائله ثم تخلصت الى الاحكام الجزئيه ثم اعطيت القانون الكل للمعالجه ثم نزل نزلت المعالجات الجزئيه بدواء دواء بسيط او مركب وما كان سلف ذكره من الادويه المفرده ومنفعتها لامراض في كتاب الادويه المفرده في الجداول 
wal asbaag allati ara istamalaha next is father of surgery al zahrawi or as known in the west abul cases as he is known in the west with by this name even today if you go to cordoba in the street called kali abu cases house number 6 you will see a name plate where there is written this is the house where al zahrawi or abu cases lived I wonder that why so much respect to a Muslim scientist whereas after the fall of Spain Muslims were massacred brutally and they were annihilated a virtual genocide had occurred combing the Muslims alone they were only given two options to convert to Christianity or leave the answer is that Abu Kaysis or Al Zahrawi was the founder of surgery in the real sense Born in 936 AD in Medina to Zahra, Spain, situated just eight kilometers away from Cordoba at that time, he was educated in Cordoba, worked as a surgeon, cum physician with the Caliph Abdul Rahman, and died in Cordoba in 1013 AD. This illustrious surgeon wrote a 30-volume book named Kitab al-Tasrif about surgery, which also included other medical subjects. His book remained a standard textbook of surgery for more than 500 years in Europe, especially Italy. Internationally, his book is considered as the first surgical book ever. Its Oxford edition was published in 1778 AD. It was translated in Latin, Spanish and English languages. A French translation was published in 1961 as well. Its handwritten manuscripts are kept in Morocco, Turkey, India and Egypt in various libraries. The book also has diagrams originally done by Al Zahrawi. His book has many volumes on medicine, dentistry, pathology, anatomy, physiology, pharmacology and gynecology etc. The last chapter or volume of the 30 volume book is about surgery about which he says that he kept surgery in the last because it is the best form of medicine. He said that anatomical knowledge of arteries, veins, muscles and nerves is a must for a surgeon. He is the first one to do thyroidectomy. He used to do mammoplasty for gynecomastia and mastectomy for breast cancer. He is the first one to make many surgical instruments or ornaments for example syringes, rods, cannuli, silk sutures and catgut for internal suturing. instruments to examine urethra and to eradicate stones while still in bladder he invented scalpels retractors curettes pincers speculum and instruments for cautery he used to treat head injuries skull fractures spinal injuries hydrocephalus and other ailments he described hemophilia and its familial significance for a For a dislocated shoulder he used Cocker's method which is used even in present days. For gynecology he is the one to tell about vulture position. He told about the ligature ligatures of arteries especially about ligature of temporal artery for headache. He disagreed with the prevailing treatment of abnormal curvature of spine about the importance of anatomy he said If a surgeon does not know about anatomy he can commit a mistake which can cause death of the patient. He stressed upon early detection of cancer saying that in case of delay it will occupy a vast area of the body and will become untreatable. He was very much concerned about medical ethics. For gynecological use he made obstetrical forceps. He also used forceps to remove stones from bladder. he made some 200 surgical instruments there are these are just some of the cardinal achievements of al zahrawi but enough to give him the title of father of surgery in his book kitab ul jami ibn bitar has frequently quoted al zahrawi from his book kitab ut tasrif whose full name was kitab ut tasrif liman ajaza an at talif next we come to the jabir bin hayyan father of chemistry Jabir bin Hayyan was born 97 years after the, the the departure after the departure of Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam from this world. In two city of Khorasan in 721 AD he was born. He is known as Jabir in the western world. His father 
Ahsan Azdi was a famous Qazi of Kufa. He used to support Abbasids, so the Umayyads killed him. While Jabir was too young, his father was killed. So his mother went back to Arabia, Yemen, where Jabir learned Holy Quran. When Jabir bin Hayyan grew old, he went to Medina Munawwara and became a pupil of Imam Jafir Sadiq. Then he, uh, Jafir Sadiq was a Then he came to Kufa and established his own chemistry laboratory. He knew Greek language, so he translated many books from Greek to Arabic. In 786 AD, Harun al-Rashid became caliph and he called him to Baghdad, the, ca the capital, but Jabir bin Hayyan went back to Kufa. In the last years of Jabir bin Hayyan, he was present in his own house. Jabir bin Hayyan, like other scholars of golden era of Islam, was a polymath. His books included Kitab al Kimia, Kitab al Sab'in, Kitab al Tajammu, Kitab al Mawazin, and Kitab al Ahjar, etc. He is the first one to do classification of chemical compounds. Razi was a great admirer of his books and used to make poetry of the contents of his books. Jabir bin Hayyan also wrote in medicine, biology, geometry, grammar, logic, metaphysics, and music in addition to his main works in chemistry. His book Kitab al Muwazin is about the balance of nature. He is the first one to make experiments in chemistry. He also made instruments and utensils for chemistry, including retort and alembic. Alembic is called Qara Ambik and is used to make extracts from something by putting it on fire. He used chemical compounds like acetic acid, tartaric acid, arsenic, mercury, bismuth sulfur and antimony etc. At the desire of Imam Jafar Sadiq Anhu, he made paper which could not be affected by fire and also an ink which can be read in darkness. He is the first one to make sulfuric and nitric acids which are commonly used today in chemistry labs etc. In his book Chemia, he stresses upon the importance of making experiments in set the most important thing in chemistry is experimentation. One who does not base his knowledge upon the foundation of experiments makes mistakes. So if you want the real knowledge of chemistry, then make experiments. In his book, he told how to make steel, color the leather to varnish iron to protect from rusting, making hair dye and acids. He divided metals into various types. He discovered and explained various reactions like calcification, evaporation, sublimation, etc. He also said that by mixing copper, iron and some other ingredient, ingredients, one can make gold. Next we come to the father of mathematics, Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi, known as Algorithmi in the Western world. He was born in 780 AD in al-Khwarizm, Uzbekistan and died in 850 AD. He was a famous polymath. Apart from his main domain of mathematics, he did remarkable job in other spheres of geography, etc. He even, he even wrote a book on history, but it could not survive the passage of time. Most likely, when the barbaric Mongols headed by Halaku Khan burned the libraries, many of, the, many of his works and manuscripts were also lost. This is the tragedy which halted or hampered the progress of Muslims. Muslims were on top of the world. They were the lone superpower of the world, but then the most cultured and advanced centers of knowledge like Baghdad and Cordoba were destroyed and most of their books were burnt or lost. When Muslims conquered Iran, Baghdad became the nucleus of art and knowledge. So many scholars from China, India, Central Asian states, etc. came to Baghdad. Al-Khwazmi was one of them. He worked in the House of Wisdom or Darul Hikmah of Caliph Mamun, Mamun Rashid, where he used to translate the Greek and Sanskrit manuscripts to Arabic. Algorithm of mathematics is associated with him and it is due to this reason that he is called Algorithmi. Al-Khwazmi is the first one to add algebra in mathematics. He wrote a great book on mathematics titled Compendious, Compendu Compendious Book of Calculation. 
compendious book of calculation which he wrote between 813 AD and 833 AD. For the first time, it describes the solution of linear equation and quadratic equation. This book was taught in the universities of Europe till the 16th century as main textbook. Its Arabic name is Al-Kitab Al-Mukhtasar Fi Hisab Al-Jabr wal muqabila Compendious means Mukhtasar or, or short. He introduced the decimal numeric system to the world. He wrote a book on the calculation with Hindu numerals which was written in 820 AD. This book introduced the Hindu or Indian Arabic numerical system to the Europe and Middle East. In this regard, he also wrote another book named Kitabul Jamawat Tafriq Fil Hisab Al Hindi. Before Al Khwarzmi, Abacus used methods were used in Europe for calculations. Al Jabr means to correct the equation, putting or removing a number from either side of the equation. It was taught by Al Khwarzmi. His book gave account of solving poly polynomial equations up to the second degree and discussed the fundamental methods of reduction and balancing on either side of the equation, on other side of the equation. That is calculation of like terms on both sides of equation. He described the method of reducing equation to six standard forms like AX, like AX square is equal to C, AX square is equal to BX and BX is equal to C, etc. Before him, there was, the, there was the geometry of Greece only without algorithms, etc. His books were translated in Latin and from there the Europe became aware of the changes. He was quite good in astronomy too and presented 116 tables of astronomical calculations and forecast. He also made charts of the movements of sun, moon and five other known planets. In trigonometry, he made tables for sine and cosine and for the first time Al Khwarizmi was the mathematician who made tables of tangents. He wrote a book on geography, Kitab Surat Al Ars, in which he improved the data of Ptolemy on Middle East and Africa. He wrote the values of Africa, Asia and Mediterranean Sea. He also made a world map for Caliph Mamun Rashid, Mamun Rashid and also helped in a, pay, in a project to know the circumference of Earth. Ptolemy had wrongly increased the length of Mediterranean Sea whereas Al Khwarizmi calculated it correctly. Ptolemy told its longitude, longitude to be 63 degrees whereas Al Khwarizmi told it to be 50 degrees and that is the correct one which is accepted even today. He also explained the Hebrew calendar and narrated the 19 year mit Metonic cycle. He also wrote the two books on using astrolabe. Next, we come to the father of optics and ophthalmology, Ibn al Hasan or Al Hasan. He was born in Basra, Iraq in 965 AD and died in 1040 AD. He was the first one to elaborate the structure of eye. He did many experiments on lenses, mirrors, reflection and refraction, etc. He was a polymath. Although famous for his book in optics, he was also a mathematician, astronomer and physicist. He narrated the laws of refraction. His famous book Kitab al-Manazir and another written on the colors of sunset was translated in Latin languages. Ibn al Hasan described the density of atmosphere in his book Mizan al Hikmah and related it to altitude. He tried to measure the height of atmosphere. He discovered that when the twilight ends or starts, the sun is 19 degrees below the horizon. It seems that he was aware of magnitude of acceleration due to gravity. He convincingly proved that the light of moon is due to the reflection of the light of sun. Till his time, it was a common notion that moon shines by itself. He gave arguments that apart from the full moon, some portion of moon is in the dark and some luminous. Then at the time of moon eclipse, the light of moon disappears, which is another proof that moon does not produce light by itself. Dr. Bibani, a poet, says in Urdu, 
आप सूरज ने रोशनी दी है चांद को कोई चोर मत बोले ट्रांसलेशन नो वन शुड से दैट मून इज अ थीफ बिकॉज द सन हैज इट सेल्फ गिवन लाइट टू द मून ही रोट मोर देन टू हंड्रेड बुक्स but alas many of his books were destroyed burnt or lost when the mongols raided and seized baghdad even the manuscript of his books on optics could not be spared and today only the latin translations are available it is said that while burning one of his manuscript an intruder laughed at the diagrams of i etc and mockingly said that what is this useless thing and then it burnt it He also wrote a book on evolution. Some of the manuscripts of his books are present in the Bodleian Library of Oxford University. This reminds of one of my own Urdu verses: "Tumhare kutb khano me jo maktootat rakhe hain, koi baghdad se aaya hai, koi kartba ka hai. Tumhare kutb khano me jo maktootat rakhe hain, koi baghdad se aaya hai, koi kartba ka hai." Translation. The manuscripts in your libraries are either from Baghdad or Cordoba. Ibn al-Hasan or Abu Hasan has been recognized as the first authentic scientist. He stressed upon adopting the scientific method. He disagreed with the concept of Ptolemy that light emerges from the eye and also refuted the belief of Aristotle that vision works when the essence of things pierces through the eyes. Instead, he concluded that a person pierces vision when perceives vision when light waves from the object enter the eyes in the form of straight waves he said that the lens increases the magnitude of objects he said that angle of occurrence and angle of reflection does not remain the same he described the vision by two eyes he used the dark chamber and he is the first one to do that he also invented camera obscura long before the popular invention of a picture taking camera In his book Kitabul Manazir he discussed about rainbow the largest size of image in mirror the opposite vision of pictures formation of halos halos and colors etc he is the first one to discover the first law of motion as said by newton he said that a moving object will always be moving in the absence of an external force he explained the relationship between algebra and geometry An untoward incident in occurred in his life when in those days the river Nile used to flood frequently. He suggested that he can make such dams on river Nile which will prevent it from flooding as well as save water to be used later on. Hearing this, the Fatimid caliph called him in Egypt and gave him the task to do that. Ibn al-Hasan after closely examining the site concluded that although theoretically he was very right but due to the absence of machines and technology at that time it was not possible to do that to avoid the caliph's wrath he pretended to be insane and was jailed till 1021 ad when the caliph died he was freed and he went to al azhar university a crater on moon has been named al hazan crater and the an asteroid an asteroid has been ascribed to him next is the man who has impressed me the most and as a reason for that there is an incident which i will quote later he is another another gem from al khwarizm a city of uzbekistan where abu rehan muhammad al biruni was born in 1973 ad al biruni was an expert in physics for which he should be considered as a founder or father of physics apart from physics he was a pioneer of anthropology astronomy medicine philosophy and mathematics Al Biruni was born in outskirts of Al Khwarizm so when he shifted downtown in the city there after the, he was called as Al Biruni he remained in Al Khwarizm for first 25 years of his life he knew the Khwarizmi language very well but this language became extinct with the passage of time and got absorbed in Turkish language in 995 AD he moved to Bukhara he had several meetings with Ibn Sina In 1000 AD he wrote his first book Atharul Baqiya min al-Qurun al-Khaliya. In 1017 AD when Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi conquered the city of Ray he brought many scholars including Al-Biruni to Ghazni. Once Mahmud Ghaznavi decided to test his knowledge of astrology he asked him that from which of the four gates of his palace he will go out. 
Biruni wrote his answer on a piece of paper. At this, Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi laughed and went out from another door, which was specially built on that day in a wall. Later on, when he saw the reply of Al Biruni, he was astonished because it was written there that you will not go out from any of these doors; rather, a new door will be made for you. He did not stop here, but he to test his knowledge more. He ordered that Al Biruni should be thrown from the wall of his palace, but he secretly made a web to protect him and land safely. Al Biruni remained calm and quiet, and when thrown, he landed safely. When Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi asked him that why did not you uh, you panic when I ordered about you to be thrown down from the very huge from the very high wall, Al Biruni said. That from my own astronomical knowledge, I knew that this was going to happen today, so I was not worried at all. Sultan Mahmud was a very tough guy and a real warrior. When he conquered Khwarizm, he killed teacher of Al Biruni on uh, on being a non-believer. Al Biruni barely escaped, but he wanted to work with Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi as he wanted to know more about India. Al Biruni accompanied Mahmud Ghaznavi in all 17 times that he attacked on India. He closely studied the Indian culture and traditions and then wrote the book Tarikh ul Hind or History of Hind. He studied Hindustan, he studied Hinduism, Buddhism, Jewism, Christianity and and Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism and then concluded that Islam is the best religion of all. He is considered one. He is considered an expert of India. In his book, he wrote that Hindus do not like Muslims and do not share anything with them. He also studied the Indian calendar and compared it with the Hijri calendar and European and Persian calendars. He also mentioned about the different rivers, cities, and castles of India, from which people come to know about the extinct, came to know about the extinct cities, because some of the cities which he mentioned are no more there. Interestingly, he did not mention about any Indian wars or battles. He learned the Sanskrit language once. He stayed in Ajmer for quite some time when he came along with Mahmud Ghaznavi. He translated geometry or Akhlidas to Sanskrit and translated the religious book of Hindus Bhagat Gita to Arabic. When Mahmud Ghaznavi issued a coin with Arabic scripts of Shahada and Bismillah, a translation in Sanskrit was also written on the coins and Translation of Shahada was Awek Tum Ekum Muhammadan Otar, and the translation of Bismillah was Awek Ta Nam. The mint name is Muhammad Pur, which is the old name of Lahore, and it is believed that Al Biruni is the one who translate who made these translations. He contributed so much to the physics that it is justified to call him father of physics. He devised a method to know the distance of sun from the earth. He explained about the different phases of moon. He found the radius and circumference of Earth. He criticized some of the beliefs of Aristotle and proved them wrong. He explained the use of astrolabe and to find time from it. He divided hours into minutes and seconds, but did not invent the watch, although he made some diagrams resembling a clock. In 1749, a scientist Richard Dunthorne used his data of moon eclipse. eclipse Moon eclipse to find acceleration of month. He devised experiments to know about the density of a thing. For physics mechanics, for physics mechanics, he used scientific methods to know about the radius of Earth. He calculated it by the height of a mountain near Pin Dadan Khan, Pin Dadan Khan in Punjab, Pakistan. He used trigonometry to know the radius of Earth by knowing the height of a mountain and dip in horizon from the top of the hill. It came out to be three thousand nine hundred twenty-eight point seven seven miles, which is just two percent more than the actual three thousand eight hundred forty-seven point eight zero miles. This difference occurred because Al Biruni did not know about the atmospheric refraction and he did not include it in the measurement. Today we know that Christopher Columbus discovered America on October 12, 1492. On October 12, 1492, which is also called Columbus Day, but much more, but but much before him, Al Biruni claimed that for sure there is a patch of land in the vast oceans 
of Asia and Europe. When he compared the total area of Asia, Africa and Europe with the circumference of the earth which he himself had discovered or measured, he said that this is just two-fifths of the whole area. In rest of the area there must be a big piece of land. He said that geographical processes which, ma which made these continents must have created some more land. This is what we know as Americas today. He explained the phenomenon of moon and sun eclipse. He calculated the age of earth and also the age of land on earth. He compared the speed of light and sound and said that the speed of light is far more than the speed of sound. The mathematicians call him the founder of calculus. He could rightly tell the direction of Qibla. He was an expert mathematician as well as, as well who benefited from the works of Archimedes, Euclides or Euclid and Ptolemy also called Bethlehemus. He studied and explained the solar system, the revolution of planets and movement of sun and cal calculated the variation in the duration of day and night, changes in weather and seasons. He also explained the monthly changes in the size of moon and also that on some places of the world there is always a daytime. In his book Lawazul Harkatan al-Biruni explained about the movement of earth and other planets. He wrote a whole book on astrolab and showed how the height of distant objects like a tree or mountain can be measured with its help. In 1030 AD his biggest book Kanun Mas'udi was released which was named after the son of Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi called Masood Ghaznavi. It was Al-Biruni who had solved the myth of the idol of Somnath which was suspended in the air. When Mahmud Ghaznavi conquered Somnath after a fierce battle, Al-Biruni observed the suspended idol and asked to remove some stones from a wall. At this the idol got deflected to the other side and when some more stones were removed it fell. It was then known that the idol was suspended in the air because the walls, the floor and the roof were made of magnetic material which had balanced the idol right in the center. On 12 December 1015 AD, Al-Biruni died in Ghazni, Afghanistan. A crater on moon has been named after him and in 1974 a movie in Russia was made on his life and achievements. Next is another great polymath, Abu Bakr Muhammad bin Zakriya Razi, also called Rezis in the Western world. Born in Ray, the city of Iran near Tehran, he is considered as father of pediatrics, psychology, gynecology and obstetrics. Razi or Rezis, as called in Europe, himself wrote a 25 volume comprehensive book named Al-Havi in which all diseases and their treatments have been mentioned. Beg your pardon because I put off the AC to get a good sound. He cautioned to avoid smallpox because it can transfer in the early stages. And in Al-Hawi he discussed all diseases of children and also mentioned their treatment. He specially wrote about childhood diseases and he elaborated the difference between smallpox and measles. He wrote a book on the diseases of children in which he described the diseases of childhood. At first he remained busy in trying to convert the available metals to gold, but he shifted to Baghdad. There he learned a lot from Sheikh Al-Tabri and then was appointed a physician in the governor, government hospital of Baghdad. He worked the whole life in Baghdad and in the light of his experience he wrote the book Al-Havi which is found in the European libraries. It was twice translated to Latin language. His second most important book is called Al Mansuri, which he wrote about, uh, which he wrote after the name of his friend named Mansur bin Muhammad bin Ishaq. Therefore, it is called Kitab Al Mansuri. Its contents include pharmacology, diet and food, skin diseases, fever, poisoning, wounds, etc. He made a balance to know the scientific gravity, which is to date in use. Al-Razi is considered as the second most important scholar of chemistry. He wrote many books on chemistry and mentioned many new tools. His book Al-Hawi was included in the course of medical schools in Paris till 1395 AD. The manuscript of his book Al-Mansuri uh, is preserved in British Museum 
Alexandria and Mosul, etc. Al-Razi was so much fond of studying that in the last years of his life he became blind because of overstudying. As a teacher, students used to encircle him which, uh, while he was in the center and the same goes on today. When in Baghdad the Caliph Isuddin Dawla decided to build a hospital, Al-Razi took some, pic some pieces of meat and hung them in different areas of the city, so he concluded that the area where the meat putrefied, putrefied more than others was an infectious area and that is the area where the patients most needed a hospital. So the hospital was built there. Newton is considered as formal founder of the theory of gravitational force, but Al-Razi wrote a complete book in this regard by the title Sabab al-Wuquf al-Arz fi sama that means that uh, the cause of the earth's uh, uh, what's called uh, earth situation uh, earth occurrence or earth uh, earth hanging or standing in the sky the exact translation will be standing you know that means that why the earth is standing in the whole universe and it does not fall in this he told that earth is hanging in the space due to the gravitational forces he also emphasized that the new drugs should first be tried on small animals. Apart from his main book, Al-Hawi, he wrote many other books, for example, for joint pains, he wrote Kitab al-Sagir fi Wajal al-Mufasil, for joint diseases, Kitab fi Iral al-Mufasil, a critic view on Galen thoughts, Kitab al-Shukuq wal manaqizat al lati Kutab al-Jali Nus, Kitab al-Burhan, and Pharmacology of Common Drug, the Kitab is, the book was, Kitab al-Adwiya Mawjuda fi Kulli Makan, and on ophthalmology, uh, he wrote Kitab Fihe Atal Ayn, book on liver, heart and joints, Kitab Fihe Atal Kibda Wal Gal Wal Mufasil, book upon diseases, Kitab Fi Illa, book on diet of patients, Kitab Al Atamat Al Marda. He is the first one to write a whole book on benefits of lemonade, Makala Fi Skanjin. Books on drugs used in ophthalmology, the book was Kitab Fi Adwiyat Al Ayn, an article on rhinitis, Makala Fi Zukam. Kitab on uh, Akhlaq al-Tabib or book on medical ethics. He used to make Arabic musical instrument called Oud. In fact, he could make it, he could make it himself. Finally, an elucidation or a confusion, uh, elucidation or explanation of a confusion is necessary. The Razi which I just spoke now is famous as a physician, but there was another Razi which whose full name is Imam Fakhuddin Razi and also born in Ray, Iran in 1149 AD, but he was a famous religious scholar. He was not a scientist, but a religious scholar, and who wrote an explanation of or tafsir of the Holy Quran titled Mafati al ghaib His another book, al Mahsal, is also famous, which is about beliefs. It is about this second Razi that Allah Iqbal, the famous Urdu poet says, Jita hai Rumi, Hara hai Razi. Next we come to the father of botany or Ahmad Ibn Betar. Ibn Betar is another gem from Malji, Spain, or Al Unlas, where he was born in 1197 AD. His father was a vet, so he's called Ibn Betar. Betar in Arabic means veterinary. He learned the botanical knowledge from Abu Abbas Zabti Nabti, Abu Abbas, Abu Abbas Nabti, who made the observations and experimentation the basis of his knowledge. Ibn Betar did the same in 12, 1219 AD. Ibn Bitar migrated from Malji, Spain and reached Anatolia on the coast of North Africa. He then traveled to Bokia, Constantinople, Tunis, Tripoli, Burka and for 20 years he searched through the forests of Africa, Asia Minor, Egypt and Greece, etc. to study the herbs and plants. For 10 years he was associated as herb specialist with Ayyubid, uh, Ayyubid Sultan al Kamil. In 1227 AD, Al-Kamil made him the in charge of herbal medicine up to Damascus area as well, which helped him to study the herbs in Syria, Palestine and neighboring countries. His most famous book, Kitab al-Jame, Limufridat al-Adwiya wal aghziya describes 1400 different plants, eatables and drugs and their uses. He quoted many ancient books as well as including as well including 20 Greek and 150 Arab scholars. He also includes the quotes from Materia Medica of Discorides and from the famous book Canon of Avicenna. 
The book comprised of 900 pages. It includes many drugs and herbs which were not mentioned before by any scholar. Ibn Bitar gave complete description of rose water and orange water and told how to make them. He told how to extract oils from sesame, olives, etc. and how to make perfumes after drying substances in the retort. In the retort. His second famous book, Kitab al Mughni fil Adwiyat al Mufrida, is an encyclopedia of Islamic medicines. His other, book in, his other books include Mizan al Tabib, Maqala fil Lemun, Risalat al Ghazia wal Adwiyah, etc. The book Thesis on Lemon, Lemon is about the benefits of lemon. He had made his own garden where he grew all sorts of herbs. Unfortunately, he died in 1248 AD after testing by himself a poisonous herb. Next, we come to the father of anatomy and physiology, Ibn Nafis, who was born in Damascus in 1213 AD. He was the discoverer of blood circulation and is called Galen II. He is also called the second Avicenna. He is also reckoned as the greatest physiologist of Middle Ages. He discovered the pulmonary circulation as well as the coronary circulation. He was the chief physician of Nasiri Hospital of Sultan Salahuddin. He wrote more than 110 medical books. He studied medicine at the Nuri Hospital Baghdad for 10 years. This Nuri Hospital was made by Hazrat Nuruddin Zangi. He also used to teach law at Masturia, at Masruria school. He was also appointed as personal physician of Sultan Babirus. Ibn Rafi spent much of time in Cairo. When Al Mansuri Hospital was built, he was made the chief physician. He also saw the fall of Baghdad. He did not marry the whole life. His book, Ashamil Fitib, had 80 volumes, although he wanted to write 300. Many volumes of his book are still pre uh, preserved and saved in Stanford University, Cambridge University, Lane Medical Library, and Bodilian University. He wrote explanations of the anatomical section of Al Kanun Fitib, the great book of Avicenna. In general anatomy, he elaborated bones, muscles, nerves, arteries and veins and mentioned organs in special anatomy. He wrote many other books as well. Some of them are following a concise book of medicine named Al Majaz Fit Tip. Kitab al Mukhtar fil Aghziya. This book is about the effects of foods and diet on body. Book of ophthalmology named Al Muhaddib fil Kohl. He also wrote a book for general physicians. The main manuscript of his book, Ashamil Fit Tip, is preserved in Damascus. Ibn Nafis corrected the mistake of Galen whereby he says that blood flows from left to the right side because there, is a, there are small pores in the septum, ventricular septum. Ibn Nafis said that from right side of heart, blood goes to the lungs by pulmonary circulation. It is said that William Harvey discovered this circulation, whereas Ibn Nafis arrived at the same conclusion some 300 years ago. He also said that ventricles get blood from the arteries is in the heart and not directly from the blood in the ventricular cavities. He corrected the false concept of Galen that pulse is due to the arteries. He said that pulse has a direct link with the heart. He said that when the heart contracts, the arteries dilate and when the heart dilates, the arteries contract. He explained the structure of lungs and told that the air mixes with the blood. <clears throat> he said that the thinking process is the job of the brain and not the heart. Till those days it was thought that heart is responsible for thinking. He wrote the first scientific fiction novel, fiction novel named Theologus Autodictatus. Theologus Autodidactus. In his first book, Kitabu Shamil, he described three parts of his surgical technique. First, to inform the patient Secondly, the operation itself, and thirdly, the follow-up of the patient. In his book, Al-Majaz, he differentiated the stones of kidney and bladder and also their respective infections. He told about the swelling of kidneys. The scholars are convinced that Ibn Nafis obtained vast knowledge of human anatomy by dissection. He died in Cairo in 1288 AD. Next, we have the father of trigonometry named as Nasiruddin Tusi who was born on 18th February 1201 AD in the Tu city of Kharasan, Iran. First of all, he learned the education of Holy Quran, Hadith, Fiqah, Fiqah Jafriya, Logic, 
philosophy, medicine, mathematics, and astronomy in Tours and Hamdan. He also came to Nishapur in adolescence and attended the lectures of Qutbuddin Misri. In Mosul, he acquired the knowledge of mathematics from Kamaluddin Yunus. In the attacks of Halaku Khan and Changez Khan, he was caught by Mongol forces who were under Halaku Khan. Tusi wrote 150 books of which 25 are in Persian and the rest in Arabic language. He wrote a, he wrote a five volume book on trigonometry named Kitabul Kitabu Shakl al Kitta. He also has a book on ethics called Akhlaq-e Nasiri. Akhlaq-e Nasiri. On astronomy and its tables, he has a book named Zujjal Akhani. There is a book on Sufism and manners named Awsaf al Ashraf. He also wrote Dua'i Tawassul, which was narrated to him by Imam Mahdi in, his, in the dream. He translated the books of Ptolemy, Archimedes, and Euclid in, in, into Arabic. He, conv he convinced Halaku Khan to establish an astronomical observatory in Azerbaijan named Rasad Khanch Observatory. He made accurate planetary tables using this observatory. He made two C couple for the planetary models in which two circular movements could be converted to a linear line. He opposed the conviction of Ptolemy that Earth is stationary. He said that there are innumerable small stars in a Milky Way. It is the same thing which was mentioned by Galileo later on. He is the first one to write on spherical trigonometry. He made trigonometry as a separate branch of mathematics. He elucidated the law of tangents and gave its proof. He listed some six cases of right angle triangles in chemistry. He told about the law of conservation of mass. He died on 26 June 1274 AD in Baghdad. He is widely respected even in the West. There is a crater on moon ascribed to him, a small planet. 10269-2C has been named after him. There is a university in Iran, in Iran after his name, whereas an observatory has been named after him called Shamkhi, Shamakhi Observatory. His birthday is celebrated as Ingenious Day in Iran. Next we come to the man whose life was full of familial tragedies. Father of history or historiography, Ibn Khaldun was born on 27th May 1332 AD in Tunis. He is famous for his remarkable book of Muqaddama ibn Khaldun, which he completed in six months. His ancestors came from Yemen and he is a descendant of Hazrat Hajar bin Adi Razidara Anhu. In his childhood, first of all, he memorized the whole Quran and also got the education of Hadith, Sharia and Fiqh. When he was 17 years old, both his parents died due to plague pandemic, which caught Tunisia from 1348 to 1349 AD. Much later, when he became the Qazi or judge in Egypt and his family was coming from Tunisia to join him, their ship drowned, killing them. In 1357 AD, he was arrested on charges of treason for 22 months. He lived in Cairo and remained busy in teaching. The king of Tilmisan made him his scribe, but annoyed at something, he jailed him. After the death of king, he was released after four years. He migrated to Garnatha or Granada, Spain, but again returned to Tilmisan and after four years came back to Cairo, finally, where he spent the rest of his life. He got attached with Al-Azhar University and has made and was made Qazi or judge of Malkir. In 789 Hijri, he performed pilgrimage and after coming back from there, he completed his book Muqaddama ibn Khaldun. He died on 17 March 1406 AD. Last but not the least, we come to the father of traveling, Ibn Battuta, who traveled 117,000 kilometers, whereas his closest competitor, Marco Polo, traveled just 12,000 kilometers. Ibn Battuta was born on 24th February 1304 AD in Tangier, Morocco. In June 1325 AD, he left his house for pilgrimage at the age of 21 years and returned after 30 years. During this period, he traveled to the most of the to most of the Islamic countries, India, China, Central Asia, and Southeast Asia. <clears throat> he
He visited he visited Spain as well, but did not go to any other European country. He performed four pilgrimages. It was his routine to visit a few countries and then to perform a Hajj. He preferred to accompany a caravan to avoid looting. He married first time in Sfax. After covering 3,500 kilometers, he reached Alexandria in the start where he met Sheikh Burhanuddin who told him that one day you will become a big traveler. A big traveler. Then he went to Cairo from where he went to Medina Munawwara. There he stayed for four days and then went to Makkah Mukarma to perform pilgrimage. Then he went to Iraq and Iran. Then again he came to Baghdad and mentioned that even after seven or eight decades, the signs of persecution of Halaku Khan could still be seen. He also met the last Mongol ruler Abu Sa'id in Baghdad. In 1330 AD he performed second pilgrimage, then he went to Yemen, Somalia and Tanzania. He said that Kilwa city of Tanzania was all made up of wood and was very beautiful. Another, after another pilgrimage, he wanted to go to India, so he went to Anatolia, Cairo, Palestine, Central Asia and met Byzantine Emperor in Constantinople in 1332 AD. Ibn Battuta visited Ayah Sophia Mosque and toured Samarkand, Bukhara, Afghanistan and then entered into India by Hindu Kush mountains. He served in the court of Sultan Muhammad Tughlaq for six years. He also paid a visit to Pakistan and went to the shrine of Hazrat Baba Farid. He also traveled to in Sindh and wrote that in those days there used to be rhinoceros near the Sindh river. He then served as a judge in Maldives where according to him the women did not use hijab. He because of tough judicial decisions had to leave and went to Sri Lanka and various cities of Chittagong, Silhat, Assam etc. He then went to Sumatra where according to him the island of Sumatra was full of cloves, erica and camphor. He then went to China in 1345 AD where Mongols were ruling. He said that Chinese used to eat frogs, dogs and pigs. About Guangzhou, he said that most of the inhabitants were Muslims who had their own mosques, markets and hospitals. In 1348, he reached Damascus and went to Makkah Mukarma again for his fourth and final pilgrimage. In Damascus, he, ha he came to know that his father had died 15 years ago. He went to Tejir only to come to know that her mother died just a few months back. He then went to Spain. Granada and Valencia and went to Morocco. In February 1352, he went to the town of Togaza where all the buildings were made up of salt. Then Ibn Battuta went to Mali and returned to Morocco. In 1354 AD, the ruler of Morocco, Abu, Anas, Abu Anan Faris, asked him to write his epic travel story so that uh, so he narrated to Ibn Abu ja Ibn Jazi. Ibn Jazi. Fifteen years after his arrival back to home, he died in 1369 AD in Morocco. Al-Kindi, father of Arab philosophy, was born in Kufa and died in 873 AD in Baghdad. He used to translate books from Greek to Arabic along with Al-Khwarizmi. He conveyed the decimal system to Arabs and the rest of the world. He wrote 260 books of which 22 were on philosophy. His book Kitab Istamar al adad al-Hindi and Theory of Parallels are famous in mathematics. The West has included him to be one of the 12 most intelligent scholars of the world. Many of his manuscripts are preserved in Ayah Sophia Mosque. He wrote on weather changes, optics and eclipses. Finally, we come to Ibn Rushd, who also known as Eviros in the West. He is considered to be father of philosophy and rationalism. Born in 14 April 1126 AD in Cordoba, Spain, he wrote more than 50 books but today only two or three survive. He wrote explanations of the works of Galen, Aristotle and Aristotle. His book Kitab al zaruri Fil Mantak is about logic. He died in 1198 AD. At first he was buried in Morocco and then was buried in Cordoba in Abbas graveyard. Ibn Rushd had some controversial beliefs due to which he had to face hard time. In short, Muslims had great influence on all the dominions of science and knowledge and in the golden era of Islam, Muslims excelled in all well-known subjects of science and literature. Thank you very much.